Morning, and welcome again. This is Breakfast for New Central. My name is Mazino Peel. Our breakfast headlines begins in the west of the continent, where 16 state governors in Nigeria have endorsed the establishment of state police due to the security challenges facing the country. This was disclosed by the National Economic Council on Thursday in a report submitted to the Council at its 140th meeting held virtually and chaired by Vice President Kashim Shatima. The governors who submitted their memos also called for the review of the Nigerian constitution. The governor of Delta State, South South Nigeria, Sheriff Oberberi, has cautioned traditional rulers in the state against shielding suspects involved in the killing of four military officers and 13 soldiers in Okoma community, who really south local government area of the state. Governor Oguedevuri gave the warning when he addressed traditional rulers on the unfortunate incident at the State Traditional Rulers Council Secretariat in Asaba, the state capital. Now, the Delta State government has said two out of the four confirmed cases of Lassa fever have resulted in mortality since the outbreak of the disease in the state. The State Commissioner for Health, Dr. Joseph Onajame, who disclosed this, said the four local government areas where the outbreak was recorded include Okwe, Oshimili North, Oshimili South, and Undokwa East. We have a Lassa fever uh, outbreak in the state. The first case was uh, confirmed about 12 weeks ago. And currently, we've done about uh, 43 testing from day one to week 12. And uh, four confirmed cases, two uh, deaths so far recorded. That's a fatality rate of uh, 50%. Um, the truth is that uh, the general fatality rate for Lassa fever is 1 to 15%. We are doing a lot to ensure that uh, we curtail the, the transmission from uh, patient to our health workers, then from patient to relatives. Currently, now, we are doing a lot. And a fresh outbreak of diphtheria disease has reportedly killed four children in villages in the Mingiber local government area of Kano State. A statement issued on Thursday by the information officer of the local governments, Tasiu Dadin Dania, and made available to, a local, to local radio stations in Kano, said no fewer than 28 others have been hospitalized. Clashes between two communities in eastern Chad have killed at least 42 people in a desert region of the vast Sahel country, often hit by land disputes. The Public Security Ministry did not say who was involved in the fighting or how long it went on, but the area regularly sees clashes between sedentary farmers and nomadic breeders or other groups over land. And at least four people have died, and a fifth is missing after a fire on an oil platform off the coast of Gabon. The Ministry of Oil and Gas said the fire broke out on Wednesday afternoon on the Bakuna platform owned by Franco-British energy company Parenko and located off the Tatamba oil terminal on Gabon's southeast coast. And that's all on Breakfast Headlines. I'm Mazino Peel. Back to you, Osage and Olive. Thank you very much. Um, again, interesting stories. And of course, the focus for me is still in Delta State. Um, good to see the governor you know, speak. Uh, I saw, of course, him calling out traditional rulers to not shield the possible suspects, you know, to that very, very disastrous act. You know, and again, I feel like there's a lot more to the story than we are, you know, being told. There's a lot more that happens in those regions that we may not be aware of, you know, and 
you know, it, it pro maybe just went out of hands, you know, and, and, but it's important that we dig deeper, that the government, you know, does a lot more to ensure that those places do not remain ungoverned as they seem. Well, indeed, passions are high, and of course, depending on who you ask, they might give you a different story. Like Absolutely. I said from before, hopefully we get a clear picture of exactly what the situation was and is there. And I bet perhaps maybe well, we'll understand what's happening. Yeah. Thank Absolutely. you very much, uh, Mazino, for bringing us. And once again, welcome to Breakfast Central and welcome to New much. Central. All right. Uh, we certainly will be hoping that we get updates on that story. Like he said, and like we've been saying, depending on who you ask, it's a different story. Yeah. Some would say it's the army that attacked first. You ask the army, the army says they were ambushed by the citizens. But one thing I still hold, one key position I still hold would be that investigation should not be done by the army. The army is an interested party. You can't be a judge in your own court. So in the, yeah. in, in, the, in, your, in the avoidance, because of conflict of interest, it's important to get an independent security outfit to investigate or get an... The, the army should just not investigate itself. I mean, so or there's that part, the you know, and then, you know, there's also the part where, um, you know, like I said, you know, we, we need to understand those areas better. You know, we're speaking from a place of, yeah, I mean, we're speaking from, from many, many miles away from where that happened. Um, and a lot of people do not know what the creeks are like, do not know what those communities are like. Um, and so there's, you know, even people have mentioned that it may be beyond the story that has been told mm. when they said they were going for a peacekeeping uh, a mission. Peacekeeping for what exactly? You know, if the two communities were, communities were fighting, what exactly were they fighting or, um, over? According to what um, hear, we're hearing is um, they're fighting over land, the ancestral I mean, so, so there's, you know, those stories, you know, which could be true or could be false at the same time. Um, nobody really knows. It's a time when you would expect that the government will be truly honest with you. But another thing that is pretty, pretty obvious here is, regardless of whatever they were fighting over, it is just another case of an area that is seemingly ungoverned. And that's why you can have people who are armed that well that they can attack, you know, Nigerian military officers. Same thing happens when you hear about this in, in northern Nigeria, when you hear that people are, you know, are paying taxes to terrorists or to, to or protect to bandits, them, it's... to protect them, you know. And so there's too many of these ungoverned areas. There's too many of these places that have just been left fallow, and we've just accepted that okay, don't don't go, don't go in that region. You know, it's it's dangerous. We shouldn't be so. Um, and those are questions that the Nigerian government must start to ask and, and start to answer from now, from the federal government to, of course, the state government. You know, they're important questions. And until we, we, we have those things answered, then we're, you know, we haven't really solved the problem. What we've really done is just, you know, created Putin peace for aid. a bit. Yeah. yeah, exactly. All right. So it's, it's a thing that we'll continue to x-ray, and we hope that we can speak with people from the Okwama community directly, because their voices need to be heard at this time. Those who have had to flee the, the community because, well, they're scared of reprisal attacks. Those who may know one person or the other, you know, who has an idea of what exactly caused these, um, these issues. And, of course, you know, if it is truly a communal clash, uh, a land, you know, grabbing or land, you know, uh, tussle. Between like, the Urubus and the Ijaws. Yeah, you know, if, if that's, you know, really what it is, you know, then, of course, more questions need to be asked. And that's why I said before that the governor needs to also be smart. I don't, like, I don't blame him for taking, you know, one day or two, you know, before he started to react publicly. To and so, this. no, but, but in, a, in a way, the reaction wouldn't have been, the reaction that a number of people expected wouldn't have been to come and say, this is what is happening, this is what yeah. we're doing. It's just basically to say, please, we, you know, well, we empathize with the people whose lives have been lost, we condemn the killings, investigation is being carried um, out, yes. and we'll come with a clear picture. It's important that, you know, government officials realize that, swift reaction just so that people don't feel like you don't care yeah. or you're not at, you're not you know at the top of the matter so let people know that we are aware yeah. we empathize with those who are mourning their lost ones and we are investigating crisis communication exactly basically. just crisis communication that people within the first 24 hours it's very important i mean going I forward agree. we hope that this situation doesn't happen again but in cases of emergencies it's important that government responds as quickly as possible now did you know that today is World Water Day? What does World Water Day mean? What exactly is it made for? And why are we celebrating World Water Day? Stick around and we'll find out after this break. Welcome once again. About 200 police personnel have been deployed to the Kuriga area of uh, Kajuru, local government area of Kaduna State, in a bid to secure the safe return of the 287 abducted school children including several other kidnapped victims. The governor of Kaduna State, during a meeting with stakeholders and heads of security agencies in the state, assured residents that all those kidnapped will be rescued unheard. 
Mavilos Obomano was at the state government house in Kaduna and he tells us more. With the announcement of the deployment of troops to rescue those kidnapped by bandits in the Kuriga and Kajuri local government areas of Kaduna State, it is expected that citizens will heave a sigh of relief, expressing excitement at the information. It is remaining just 13 days before the 20 days ultimatum given by these bandits comes to an end. Government is still insisting they will not negotiate with the bandits. About 200 police personnel have been deployed to these local government areas. But with more boots on the ground help in the rescue of these abducted school children and other victims abducted by these bandits. We're here on the streets to find out. It's really a pathetic situation, having your loved one outside, far away from you. Uh, with this rate, all the measure the government is taking, uh, to me personally, I think <laughs> we're just looking to the intervention of God. These 20 days where they give, if not go government not do something about of this, anything will happen now. These people, they don't feel secure their family. Or maybe they'll leave them there, all the bandits kill them, or we don't know how this thing will do. I don't think paying the ransom is the way forward here. Because if we keep paying ransom, if these kidnappings will still continue. It's really affecting all Kaduna State because we don't know where it will be tomorrow. If they kidnap some um, near you, then the next person will be you, I think. Some of the residents say they believe that government has intelligence information of the location of the bandits, but wonder why they have not been dislodged. The government and all the government um, officials, they know where these bandits are. They cannot say they don't know where these bandits are. They know where these bandits are. They should curb this banditry. It's been very long that this is happening, self. I don't know. But government is not considering anything about them. All these bandits, um, they really are like, like the government know where they are from. They know many things about them. Though the Kaduna State government says it is intensifying efforts to rescue the kidnapped victims, Calls have also been made to residents to support security agencies with available information. In Kaduna for News Central, I am Marvelous Oboman. And of course, thanks to Marvelous Oboman for that uh, very interesting report. Um, it almost sounds like a reminder, you know, to Nigerians that there are still 200 plus people in captivity, you know, taken in Kaduna State, among other, you know, um, kidnapped victims. You remember there were 16 other persons that you know, um, the bandits demanded 40 trillion naira for. And then there's another group that demanded a billion naira. So um, it was, it's, it's maybe just a, a good moment to remind Nigerians that there are still people in captivity because what happens is we get carried away you know, with other things that are going on in the country. We get carried away with other you know, conversations and corruption and, and healthcare and, and you know, education and, and whatnot. And forget that there's more than 400 people that have been kidnapped. And I've continued to argue that no sane country has 400 of its citizens being held hostage by kidnappers and just continues, you know, like nothing's new. No sane country has that many people, not even, no sane country has two people even being held by kidnappers and, you know, everybody just goes about their business, you know, like it's business as usual, including the government, including the inspector general of police, including the heads of other security agencies and the National Assembly. Everybody just goes about their daily activities. Like, you do not see that there is a state of emergency being set, you know, um, um, uh, up, you know, across the country. In the National Assembly, those who represent the people who have been kidnapped, you don't hear from them. Like, whoever it is, you know, that represents those communities, in different parts of northern Nigeria, maybe even in the southeast, where people have been kidnapped. You don't hear their voices in the National Assembly calling for an emergency response to rescue those who have been kidnapped. It's only in Nigeria that you see things like this, and it's heartbreaking. One of the you know, people who, of course, was spoken um, um, with you know, said that he doesn't believe that the government is not aware of you know, the location of these persons or how to reach them. And we've seen government spokespersons say before that um, you know, it, it, anybody can be found in two days. I don't remember which of the spokesperson, but the, it was a police spokesperson, I believe, that tweeted that, that anybody in Nigeria can be found in two days. So why is it so hard to find these ones? And why is it so hard to put an end to kidnapping in Nigeria? What steps need to be taken? Who needs to be questioned? 
what leakages need to be blocked, who is letting these arms into the country through, you know, Nigeria's porous borders. I mean, it, it's, it's, not, it's not just one thing that needs to be done. It's a couple of things that need to come together to make it difficult for kidnappers to continue to thrive. So in, in what ways have we done, you know, any of these things? Is there one thing that we've done? Have we started to fix the borders, you know, to, re to reduce the proliferation of arms across the country? Have we started to question, you know, these money transfers and those who collect money on behalf of the bandits? Have we, you know, arrested any bandit or any kidnapper and have him confess and say, okay, this is the person who sent me and this is the, the, the leader of our gang? Is there one thing? I mean, I mean, how do you explain to anybody in any part of the world that Nigeria in the last roughly five, six, seven, eight years has been dealing with a kidnapping epidemic and still we've not been able to, you we can't point to 10 people that have been arrested by the government, you know, and, and you know, the government can say, okay, yes, these are the people who are behind this criminal gang that has been kidnapping persons in Kaduna State or in Belchu and Katsina or in anywhere. I mean, not, not, not five even. And so it's, it's, oh, I mean, it's, um, it's heartbreaking, you know, you know to, to, to put it mildly even. And we're hoping, you know, that this at least is the end. You know, I hope that when these persons are, you know, are rescued, hopefully they are rescued, that we will be able to, you know, catch a breath as Nigerians, that the government will be able to say, that, okay, yes, we've made concrete steps against kidnapping in Nigeria. Olive? Nothing more to say. You said it all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I just want us to catch a breath. You know, honestly, that's where I am. You know, I, I want us to have a week, one week in Nigeria where we don't have to talk about stories like this. And I'm sure if we look through the newspapers this morning, it's going to be up at 8, 8 a.m. this morning. And just to remind our viewers, you can call. Share your thoughts with us, you know, during the newspapers. Um, the phone lines are going to be on your screen. Um, or even any time during the show, if you have things that you want to quickly share with us, you know, concerning our conversations, let, let's have your thoughts. Um, but can we have one week where we look through the newspapers and we see cheerful stories? We see things that make us excited well, as Nigerians and say, okay, it, yes, you know, it seems to be on the, we seem to be on the right path. It's not... I mean, the Naira is picking up. That's something to be excited about. It's, it's at 1,400. Yeah, it's picking up. When so they got into power, it, got, it was it got 200. It, it was 100 plus. It got to 1,800 at some point. Yes, I know, the but it's, is, well, 1,400 is nothing to celebrate. That's my point. Well, it, we, because Take it, it could, back to 200. It could have gotten worse. It can always Absolutely. get worse. It can get to 2,000. It can get to 2,000. Well, I 100% agree. And we can honestly, genuinely always see something wrong. And, I, and not because... We're trying to be pessimistic, but because things are actually wrong. But we celebrate the little wins. No, I, 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 I don't, I don't. The I little mean. wins of it's come down to one thousand four hundred. We're hoping for better. The little wins like Lagos State owned Jericho twenty five percent discount for uh, Lagosians to shop. So yeah, there's absolutely nothing to celebrate about you know the naira exchange for a thousand four hundred naira. Well, there wouldn't be anything to celebrate at the Naira exchange for 1,200 Naira. Na neither would there be for the want, Naira exchange for, for those who don't naira. want. And it's, it's been realistic because I, we remember, and it's not necessarily saying that Nigeria didn't, you know, or shouldn't bear the brunt of global economic challenges. Yes, we should. Um, there's parts of it that we would also, you know, um, suffer, but definitely not, you know, with the, on this level. Definitely not, you know, um, um, at this state. We, we, there's no reason. Asides, I mean, there's no economist that has spoken on this issue that would tell you that, oh, this was bound to happen. No, it wasn't. It's economic policies by the government, largely, that led us where we are today. And so there's nothing. What are, what are we celebrating that it's 1,400? Mostly, and the reason I'm saying so is because the effect that that has on the life of the average Nigerian, you and I know that people can work in civil service for the next 15, 20 years, or maybe who have been working for the last 20 years, can't afford to buy a small car today. I agree. All right. Can't um, even afford to buy a second-hand car we have, today. We, we have a new female managing director of a bank, so that's something to celebrate. I'm answering your question. You said, is there any time we can look at the papers and see something to celebrate? And that's something to All celebrate. Right. Well, uh, we, of course, want to talk about more stories, so we will go on a break, and when we come back, We'll be looking straight into our top story. As the world celebrates the 2024 World Water Day today, most Nigerians are still grappling with severe cases of water scarcity, especially in the rural areas. While over 60% of the country covered in water, it is shocking that the country still grapples with severe water issues 
and the government at all levels should implement measures to increase access to portable water. Across communities in Nigeria, a necessity continues to elude millions of its citizens, and this is, of course, portable, uh, portable water. Consequently, the 2024 World Water Day with the team Water for Peace holds deep significance for Nigeria, where bandits and terrorists have displaced thousands and turned them to refugees in their own land, leaving them with no access to clean water for their daily needs. This morning, we're joined by Onye Dikachi Erete. He is the founder of Rector Cares Foundation, a non-profit organization that is dedicated to providing clean and safe drinking water to rural areas in Nigeria. Through their water projects, they have successfully delivered clean water to communities in Abia, Enugu, Imo, and Lagos, impacting over 70,000 individuals. Good morning and welcome to the show. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. And now, as we celebrate World Water Day, let's talk about the progress, or not, that Nigeria has maybe made uh, regarding uh, achieving Goal 6 of the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which is, of course, ensuring access to clean water and sanitation. So where exactly, can you give us a picture of where Nigeria is on that goal? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. And uh, as we celebrate World Water Day today, which is the theme is Water for Peace. Uh, World Water Day is celebrated every March 22nd of every year, which is the goal six of the United Nations to highlight the importance of fresh water and advocate for sustainable management of water resources. Um, where we are in Nigeria, from the data of UNICEF and um, World Health Organization, uh, they, they, we were told that over 60 million Nigerians don't have access to clean water. But um, NGOs like us uh, have been providing clean water, especially to uh, rural areas. Of, uh, from my own data, we've provided over 70,000 individuals access to clean water in the rural area with solar-powered boreholes. And I believe other organizations are also doing the same and also um, governments are also trying their best to curtail these numbers. And I believe that, that those numbers have reduced drastically if we go back to our data and check if um, the amount of people who have access to clean water. Yeah, I mean, you know, but we, we still have, you know, just certain problems, you know, that, you know, you probably would see in third world countries. And so, I mean, we still have conversations on open defecation here in Nigeria, um, which, oh. of course, you know, might, might sound a, a little bit embarrassing, um, I know that the government has every now and then set up committees and set up, you know, these policies. So tell us about where we are, you know, with um, efforts to, aside the individual efforts and the efforts of non-governmental organizations, where are we as a country with regard to providing clean water to, you know, citizens, um, pipe-borne water to residents? How many Nigerians still lack something as basic as pipe-borne water? Um... Thank you for your question. From the last, from the data, um, at least um, over 70 Niger 70 percent of Nigerians still have access to clean water, which is a good um, data from where we are before. Uh, from the numbers we got uh, from the United um, Nations, uh, we, we are far behind a few years back, but I think we're from the, the collaboration of um, NGOs, um, government, and other stakeholders with the numbers are decreasing and like the last project i did in Imo state I, uh, we built uh, a, a toilet for them which is under the wash uh, project we do under the united nations and, I, and from the numbers we, we are getting the most of this open defecation have reduced drastically and clean water is now accessible to a lot of nigerians okay um let's talk about the theme this year, Water for Peace. As you already know, we've been having conversations about insecurity because that's the reality of Nigeria. Yeah. We have over 200 school children who are in captivity. We have over 200, about 200 women who were kidnapped from the internally displaced persons uh, camp. How would you say that the, you know, this would impact their access to clean water? We have millions of Nigerians that are currently in internally displaced uh, uh, IDPs, right? And how, how would you say that this has affected their access to clean water? I don't know if you've been to any of the IDPs. What is the current reality of what these people have to go through? Yeah, um, then from the team, Water for Peace. Um, actually, water can create peace or spark conflict. Yeah, because it, 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 it goes a long way. Water, 
water no get enemy, according to legendary fella. It can bring peace and it can also spark conflict. So when there is scarce of water, and when people have only, um, don't have access to clean water, the tension rises in these communities and 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 countries. So we we have to find a way to have um, access to clean water to these IDP camps and to all these um, areas. There is no um, access to clean water because someone who have not drinking um, water for days will obviously be angry as well. So we if we can get our our reach to all these communities in the north and also to IDP camps that don't have access to clean water. I believe that there will be a lot of change. There will be more peace, which is the theme of this year. And every, there will not be any conflicts at all in the country. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, I mean, your NGO does work in different regions in the country. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, tell us what the realities are, you know, from what you've experienced. Um, which parts, you know, are, are largely affected by, you know, lack of clean um, water, you know, and, and which regions do you think need the most um, assistance at, a, at this time? Um, and we've done, like you said earlier, we've done projects in Lagos, Imo, Abia, Enugu State. Um, from, uh, from our um, experience going to all these communities, honestly, uh, most most part of Nigeria is always the urban area that have access to clean water because they have um, um, advanced water purification done by the government with underground pipes lit, um, connected to all the homes um, in the in the city like Lagos, Abuja, etc. But in rural areas where they don't have all these underground pipes leading to their homes, you have to drill boreholes for them. And the place uh, affected are places that have um, their topography is very, very strong because of maybe their, their hilly topography. Like, uh, for example, our last project in Osaka, Inugu State, be be because of the topography, we had to drill over 900 feet to get clean water. So it, as feel is the same with, with northern, northern parts of Nigeria, where you have to drill that uh, deep um, 900 feet to get clean water, which is very, very difficult and financial um, um, costly to do such boreholes. I believe that with um, if there if there are more stakeholders who are getting involved in in making sure access to clean water gets to this area and um, the finances are there, I believe that we can curtail the numbers and help these um, areas like the northern part where the topography is very strong and also places like Enugu as well and access and they can have access to clean water. Okay, um, let's also talk about, you know, the actions that individuals can take to save water. You know, we hear about the little things like, you know, fixing leaky taps and all that, but not enough information is spread across. People use water recklessly and randomly, you know, especially in places like Nigeria, where you don't have to really pay for a water bill, unlike in other mm -hmm. parts of the world where you pay water bills. So what are the ways in which individuals and families can collectively uh, save, help save uh, water? Oh, okay. Um, everything boils down to um, ensuring sustainability. For most of our like NGOs like us, we do projects in all these communities. They, you have to like let them know that um, this project, this sustainability is more of like a key to longevity of what water project. You can build a water project and give it to a community and if they don't have this sense of um, sustainability and owner sense of ownership within the community, the project is going to die within one year. So I believe that getting involved in, with local stakeholders in the project planning and maintenance, we can ensure preservation of success of this water and letting these communities know the 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 what they have is very very um, essential to them, which is clean water. And also, Erector Cares Foundation, we collaborated with um, an organization called Groomforce, where we, where, where we provided a, an, an equipment called AQTAP. So with this AQTAP, you can also, like, uh, is that a type of revenue to, to, for this water project, where you can, it's like an ATM machine where you tap on the ATM, on the, on the, on the equipment, and water comes out. So this particular idea is to curtail 
the idea of um, everything is free as well in Nigeria, where whereas abroad people pay for water. So we're trying to bring that idea to them that you can also pay for water. And once you pay for it, you can also know the value of this water and not just open taps 24 hours without using this water. Anytime you open your tap and you want to use water, make sure you're, you're trying to use it for something important. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, you know, you would need to get to a state of, you know, proper water infrastructure, you know, for you know, for those things to become common. You know, as it stands, you know, that that might be a little tough. Um, yeah. You know, also talk, you know, a little bit about, you know, um, climate change and how that has also affected um, um, water you know, and, and its availability across uh, Nigeria and across Africa. I didn't get your question, sorry. I'm asking, you know, about climate change and how that has affected um, water and av availability of, of clean water across uh, the continent and here in Nigeria also. Oh, okay. Um, climate change poses a significant um, threat to water resources, um, altering the patterns, um, droughts especially, and increasing frequency of extreme weather events like to for like like I said, the drought area to ensure sustainability, we must prioritize adaptation of all these mitigation measures in, 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 in what we do, including the water efficiency technologies so that when there is drought, we, can, we, we have technologies which can um, help, for example, um, rainwater harvesting is, an, is an, an area most Asian countries use in, uh, for access to clean water when they have um, drought and drought um, experience, and also trying to um, build more of advanced water pro, um, purification projects and additionally fostering international cooperation with implementing climate resilient policies that will be crucial in safeguarding water resources for future generations in, in Nigeria. All right, we certainly hope that we get to see more of the impact of the work that you and your organization are doing. On a final note, I think uh, you're, in the, you're in England at the moment. What are some of yeah. the modern best practices that we can pick from other countries to help uh, access and affordable uh, help us have accessible and affordable water? Um, by emulating global success, like for for Nigeria, we over sixty million people don't have access to clean water. We can emulate global successes from uh, countries like England, US, Asia. Like in Europe, they use more of advanced water purification, um, where you, you, you have to um, include a membrane, membrane filtration and reverse osmosis to ensure clean water supply. And also in US, they use more of like, uh, they recycle their water. So most of the water used in, for your, in your toilet, when you bathe, it kind of goes, goes through another recycling of an advanced um, water purification and goes back you like it's just a re, you have to recycle them sometimes you also use waste uh, um, waste water also you have to purify it i feel we can emulate most most of these um global successes and technology leveraging on the technology they've been using all these years we, f we feel like deploying water purification technologies can also help in nigeria situation and also connecting all these pipes to rural areas because we focus on more of the urban area. We, we don't know that the rural areas also have, don't have access to clean water. So we have to also try our best to also have a reaching hand to the rural areas in Nigeria. Right, uh, Edikachi, thank you very much for joining us. We wish you all the best. And we hope thank that in the happy. next, by the time we celebrate World Water Day 2024, the numbers would have reduced drastically because, 2025, I beg your pardon. The numbers would have reduced drastically. We have more access or more people access and affordable water, portable yeah, water. Thank, thank you. Yeah, our goal in Rector Cares Foundation to see that we can give millions of people access to clean water and we are pushing towards that goal. Well done. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Away from uh, the water, uh, World Water Day, let's go to Edo State now, where the Council of the Nigerian Labour Congress yesterday picketed the State Labour Party Secretariat at Ugbilaka Street off Sakumba Road, Benin uh, City, over alleged contempt of the Nigerian Labour Congress by the party's national chairman, Julius Aburi. 
Now, given further reasons for the incident, the state vice chairman of the NLC, Suleiman Abubakar, said Abure was running the party like his personal business. A secular signed by Titus Amba and Chris Uyot, chairperson and secretary of the NLC Political Commission, directed that all Labour Party state secretariats be picketed by the State Council of the Nigeria Labour Congress. Abu Bakr said the Labour Party belongs to the NLC and therefore the NLC should be carried along in every decision the Labour Party makes. Recall that on Wednesday, Nigerian workers forcefully broke a barricade set by the Nigeria Police Force at the Labour Party headquarters in Abuja over what they called hijacking of the party by Julius Abure. Well, there you have it. Uh, the drama between the Labour Party and the NLC is an ongoing one. We certainly would want to see how this eventually turns out. The Labour Party has said, and you know, rightfully so, that the NLC rather that they own the Labour Party. So, Labour Party is expected to to do as as told. But it would make sense what their calls are in the sense of asking Julius Abure to choose between being a union leader or a politician. I don't think that both can act actively be intermarried, right? Yeah. If you want to be a union leader. You're be talking a union... about Joa Jero now? Sorry, yes. Joa Jero. If you want to be a union leader, be a union leader. You know, if you want to be a politician, be a politician, you know. So even with... Actually, I was talking about Julius Abure, not uh, uh, Joa Jero. So it's just... They've been asking for his resignation and asking him to decide exactly what what he's standing for. They've accused him of hijacking, accused him of um, misconduct and all sorts. So, I, I mean, I, I don't, I'm pretty much exhausted with the politicking right now of the NLC and all that's going on within it. But I, I don't think that their cries are far from the truth, even though the Labour Party claims that what is going on with the NLC is the APC that has planted people to disrupt the internal workings of the Labour Party. Well, those are rhetor rhetorics. Um, it's also not strange to hear, you know, those um, accusations. Um, it's not just Labour Party that has even mentioned. I think I've also seen a few social commentators, you know, say the same thing that it, it feels like uh, it's an it's uh, been engineered from the outside uh, to cause some implosion in you know Labour Party. And there's those who have also said, you know, they don't care. You know, um, if it be leaves Labour Party tomorrow, they move with him. And Labour Party is, you know, irrelevant almost immediately. You know, there, there's been a lot of those type of statements being made here and there. Um, but like, you know, you mentioned, and of course our guest yesterday did, did also say the same thing. Um, his thoughts, you know, concerning Joe Adjero and the NLC, you know, said, you know, he's, he seems to be the most unfocused um, NLC president that we've had. And we've not really been able to achieve anything as a, uh, a day rather, I've not been able to achieve anything as a Nigerian Labour Congress, you know, since Joe Adjero, you know, has been there. Ayuba Waba, you know, I mean, in my opinion, wasn't so different, but I don't think he involved himself so much in, you know, in, in politics um, as much as Georgia has, you know, involved, involved himself. Um, we saw what happened in Imo State where he was assaulted. Till now, there wasn't any case, you know, brought against those who assaulted him, you know, and it seems like he, you know, basically just decided to accept, you know, that maybe he had it coming and he went home, you know, to continue living his life. And so... Um, Yes, you know, for those who say that he's involved, in, he's getting himself involved too much in politics and political conversation, it's not a good look, you know, because it makes the NLC then seem questionable and their motives questionable when they truly then have demands of government, you know, so, so there is that. Um, I would also like to, see, to hear clear accusations, you know, not just these vague statements, you know, of, oh, you know, he's not, I, I, I'm, listen to us or what we say. He is not, he's not acting like he's answerable to us. Oh, we own the party, so he should be answerable. Those are, you know, pretty much vague. You know, let, let's have clear accusations on what Julius Abreu may be guilty of. In response also, I did fault yesterday when Julius Abreu was responding to the picketing of the offices, and he said, you know, that bi property worth billions of, of Naira were destroyed. That's not all that he said, the, though. He even said salaries. Yeah, salaries, and salaries were, were taken. taken. Yeah, money. Stolen you, from yeah, exactly. the protesters. Stolen by the protesters. Mm. Which might be true, you know, I'm, I, I mean, I wasn't there. Might be true, but it just really sounds, you know, once again, like, I mean, you're still not saying anything, you know, that, you know, it, you know, it's tangible. And if probably what billions of Naira, you know, were actually destroyed, I don't know which Labour Party secretary has property worth billions of Naira, but if property worth billions of Naira were actually destroyed, you know, then you should be approaching the police and you should be calling on the police to, or at least, you know, writing a proper petition to the police to ensure that those people who, you know, went to the Labour Party's office, you know, are arrested and questioned, you know, and of course, you know, we, we build a case from there, or they build a case from there. So it's, um, 
you, I mean, the accusations are back and forth, back and forth. You know, nobody seems to be saying anything concrete. We'll see how this, you know, eventually turns um, out um, over time. All right. Um, we, of course, will be looking at uh, some of these conversations as we proceed. And we'd like to get your thoughts on them. If you'd like to share your thoughts on any of the stories, remember, you can tweet at us individually or you can tweet at New Central TV. Every morning on Breakfast Central, every other morning, we have Which Way Nigeria, where we ask some very strong questions. Questions that will have the government thinking, questions that will have you thinking, and we're hoping, you know, that would uh, that will be taken that much later on in the show. But uh, let's move on to other conversations. For many Nigerians, the dream of a quick weekend getaway or a business trip within the country um, has turned into dreams. Soaring airfare prices have driven passengers away, leaving once bustling airport terminals somewhat empty. New Central's Lekon Onobanjo has details in this report. Gone are the days of bustling crowds at the Murtala Mohammed Airport in Lagos or the General Aviation Terminal. Airline staff now complain of processing a trickle of passengers instead of the usual throngs. The culprits, a double whammy of rising aviation fuel costs, reaching a staggering 1,300 naira per litre and a weak naira compared to the dollar. Airlines are facing a brutal squeeze. A word of subsidy on the petroleum products have brought a general inflation in all in almost all places of the economy, and um, with the airlines are not isolated, well, the basic state of the naira to the dollar, uh, considering that in, in most of the trainings, uh, re uh, repairs, and uh, payment of leases are done in dollars. All this has affected the cost of operation and also will reflect in the fares that have been paid. Economy tickets that used to cost around 50,000 naira for a Lagos to Abuja flight have doubled or even tripled in some cases. The pain is evident. Travel agents report a drastic drop in bookings. You follow the trend, the the, 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 the price of the, of the ticket fare swings. It swings to the to demand. It swings to the uh, to the algorithm of uh, of the uh, computer system of some of these airlines, which, which are programmed uh, to manage uh, revenue and ticket. Revenue stands where the actual range when you go through the website is X amount, but for the travel agents, there's some sort of discount, you know, so that that margin is what they get. Now, where you have a situation where the margin is really thin, it's thin it, it was thin initially, now it is thinner, right? So in terms of their profit margin, it's declining. Airlines now operate with half-empty planes, which means burning cash. To survive, some carriers are resorting to sharing flights with competitors and sharing the cost and revenue. Passengers and airlines alike are now looking towards the government for a solution. Government intervention is big, and I think there has to be that roundtable conversation between the government authorities, the various agencies and the regulators, and the operators in this industry, right? Until a solution is found, Nigeria's airports will likely remain a shadow of the former selves, echoing with the silence of grounded and unfulfilled travel plans. In Lagos for New Central, Lekon Onobanjo. Thanks to Lekon Nabanjo for that, uh, you know, pretty interesting report. Once again, showing the, you know, stark reality, you know, of, um, uh, of things as, you know, I mean, that Nigerians have to deal with. Um, air flight, you know, prices currently are some of the highest. They may be the highest that, they, that they've ever been. I think about two weeks ago, you know, the average flight, um, cost for a flight is about 150,000 naira within Nigeria. International um, um, flights, you know, are way worse than that. You know, I did try to book a flight to Rwanda in, I think it was in November 2023, October, November 2023. I remember then that it was still around 560,000. You know, I had the opportunity of even paying, you know, you know um, uh, twice or about four times, but I didn't take that opportunity. Eventually, when it was time, or when I felt it was time to book the flight, it was hitting about a million naira. And currently, it is more than a million naira to go to. Um, um, Kigali. Um, there's other places, of course. You know, Dakar is also more than a million naira. South Africa also more than a million naira. If you want to go to Zanzibar, more than a million naira. And these are places that, you know, maybe a year ago, more than a year ago, you know, you could randomly find return tickets to these places for less than 500,000. It's, it's insane how much things are different now uh, for those who want to, you know, still travel. Even, not a lot of people who can even afford uh, to be tourists at this point or to go for leisure trips. Um, but if you have to, Air flight uh, prices are completely insane at this point. I mean, wish you well.
Welcome back. Now let's uh, take you on a quick journey across the newspapers this morning, share with you the big stories, making headlines across uh, Nigeria. We're going to be kicking off on the Daily Times. And remember, um, at any time during the show, you're welcome to call in, right? If any of the stories excite you, you have uh, thoughts to share on them, please dial the numbers on your screen and we'd love to speak with you. Let's kick off with the Daily Times this morning. Yes, big one on the on the screen that says Don Shield suspect Obore Wuri warns Monax, and that's the governor of Delta State. Don Shield suspects uh, it says those who committed the evil act must face the full wrath of the law. Seventy percent of bomb making materials enter Nigeria under disguise, says Interior Minister. Interesting. U.S. Nigeria others unveil food security strategic country plan. And also election, Jonathan leads West, Africa, uh, West African elders to Senegal. Okay. We can also find on the Daily uh, the Times this morning, NEC endorses takeoff of $617 million uh, I dice program for Nigerians. And also Nigeria poised to lead Africa in digital technology, says um, President uh, Tinubu. These are the big stories on the Daily Times newspapers this morning. I'm not sure what to make of the story on 70% of bomb making materials entering Nigeria under disguise. What, what does that even mean? I haven't read it yet. I, I don't know what it means as well, but I want to imagine that they're talking about the porosity of our borders. And I'm hoping that this again flags the need for us to check that. The conversation about how porous our borders are, these, these are conversations we've been having for years, but nobody really does much about it. Again, referencing the documentary that Peter Yoshoyombo did, uh, talking about how easy it was for him to import 60, rice. was it 60 or 100 bags of rice yeah. into Nigeria, right? So if he could import it that easily, contraband, it was contraband. Imagine what, what other things are passing through our borders. Yeah. I want to imagine that it's the Nigerian customs they're talking about. Because there's no other way that bombs should be entering our country. They, they can't enter through the airport because... The security systems will flag those. So the only other way is through our borders. Yeah, but we've not had, um, you know, any you know bombing incidents, you know, in a in a while. So it might be better to know exactly what the story is about. You know, might, that might be safer. You know, he, it may not be. It may not necessarily be a security, you know, you know issue. Um, but still, if anything is entering Nigeria on, the, you know, uh, through some disguise or the other, it's something to be worried about. You know, and you know should raise some red flags here and there. Um, but once again, it says 70% of bomb-making materials enter Nigeria under disguise, and that is from the Interior Minister. The story in Delta State, once again, Don Shield suspects Obore Ori warns monarchs. We spoke about this earlier, and you know, I did mention you know, that I think it was important that the governor definitely stepped in at a time like this to ensure that he takes control of his state. If you know certain regions or certain parts of the state, you know, had you know got you know uh, broken into um, chaos, it's important that you know he he steps up you know at this point to protect those lives and ensure that those who had to flee uh, Okwama can return you know to live their lives you know if they aren't guilty if they had no you know role played no part in the murdering of those Nigerian soldiers you can come back and that's one of the things that the governor should be assuring residents that you can come back there's nothing you know, that, you know, is chasing you away as long as you're not guilty. He's also made mentioned, you know, that traditional rulers and monarchs must not shield the suspects. If there's a proper investigation, that must be carried out. And I agree with him. Nobody should stand in, you know, in the way of that investigation, no matter how highly placed you are in the society. Um, but, of course, you know, looking at the little, the technicalities of those areas, those are parts, you know, of Nigeria that, you know, if you don't live there, you don't know exactly how things are run over there. And, you know, I mentioned that, you know, one of our guests mentioned that there's many ungoverned areas in Nigeria, places that, you know, you have uh, militant leaders, you know, holding forth. You know, they run, you know, the show in those places. You have bandit leaders, you know, running the show in those places. You have maybe traditional rulers, every, you know, um, um, sort of, of, of person. And those are places that you do not necessarily have a large presence of, of uh, police um, um, agents there. A police officers there, you, you know, you may not have that. So those are the little details here and there that I think that we need to also explore and, you know, expose and say, okay, this is the reason it may not be as easy to just pick out the suspects, have them interrogated, have them investigated and, and you know, go scot-free. It's a lot deeper than, you know, what we can just say on television, I believe. Still not an excuse. Those people that committed that atrocity must be arrested, should not be shielded by anybody 
in, in government in the traditional space or in, in any um, um, uh, way, shape or form should not be shielded. They, they must be arrested. Those are the stories on the Daily Time. Just to quickly remind you, join us um, with the phone lines or phone numbers. Uh, share your thoughts with us. If you are from Okwama, if you're watching us from Delta State this morning, it would be nice to hear from you, all right? Let us know what the realities are in those parts of the country, all right? If you're in Delta State or you're from Delta State or you've lived, you know, some time in your life in Delta State, let's know what the realities are, you know, in, in those places. You know, are, are, are there certain areas that you are aware that, you know, doesn't have a lot of police presence? Um, there are certain people who run the show in those areas that you just do not you know, cross the lines with them, regardless of who you are. You know, is that maybe the, the picture here? Or, you know, if it is a land tussle between one tribe or, or one community and the other, you know, is that what we maybe are dealing with here that you are aware of? Quickly share with us, you know, via the phone line this morning. We would love to, absolutely love to hear from you. And of course, if you also have ideas on how the government may be able to tackle these issues um, uh, through security agencies or through, you know, government policies, we'd also love to hear that All right. this morning. Uh, let's uh, move away from the Daily Times newspaper and go to our next paper, this Nigeria newspaper. On the front page, again, NLC pickets Labour Party secretariat in Benin. Party belongs to Nigerian workers, not Labour, says Lauren Femi. And again, everyone's still talking about the Okwama killings. I'll deal with any monarch who shields suspects, says Governor Obure Wuri. Alleged 29 billion naira fraud. Um, ESCC rearranged Nyako, Son, and others. Of course, there's the update. If you look up that story, you see how the ESCC is prosecuting Mr. Nyako and his son, Abdulaziz, as well as uh, Zulfilik uh, Abba, uh, Zulfilik Abba, and uh, <laughs> their reports. I did see an article. I went to look for it. It's an article on the Premium Times talking about how Buari wanted to help drop Nyako's 29 billion naira fraud case. But that's an, uh, another conversation for another day. Lagos arrests hoodlums collecting fees for pedestrian bridge users. I think that's something to talk about. IPI Nigeria demands immediate release of Olatunji editor First News. Now, this is a conversation that has been ongoing. Um, the kidnap, the unfortunate, I mean, I don't know if we are quite sure exactly what it is right now. Do you, do you have an update on that, Osagi? I'm going to quickly double check. Uh, what the situation is with Olatunji, if it was a kidnap or, you know, what exactly it is. But um, the International Press Institute of Nigeria calling for President Tinubu to prevail on the security agencies to secure the immediate release of the editor of First News, Mr. Ashegun Olatunji, who was allegedly abducted by uniformed men last Friday. And uh, he said that he's entitled to his personal liberty and if, however, he has committed an offense, he should be charged before the court. Uh, a court of competent jurisdiction. He was reportedly whisked away by 10 armed men. And to date, nothing has been heard of his whereabouts. As of this point, no security agency, no one has admitted to or owned up, owned up to having him within their yeah. custody. So I'm hoping that this is not a case of something more than uh, an arrest. I'm hoping it's not a kidnap. Typically, if it were a kidnap by now, they should have called for a ransom. So it's a bit scary, a bit it is frightening. Scary. Um, Actually, not yeah. even, very frightening. And, you know, like the police spokesperson um, bragged, you know, that they can find anybody in two days. I'm hoping that they put their resources um, out there, you know, and of course are able to find Olatunji. Um, what scares me about this, you know, is I remember that um, there's a young man, Dariata, was kidnapped in Kaduna in 20, um, 2016 or 2017, I don't remember, you know, I think that period that till date has not been found. He left behind, you know, family, uh, wife and, and uh, daughter, I believe. Um, till date has not been found. He was a critic, you know, of the government, critic of the government, state government, um, you know, on social media back then. Um, and it was pretty much the same story, that someday, you know, he was arrested by persons who claimed, or, you know, someone saw that he was being arrested by persons who looked like they were police officers or like they were from security agencies or, or, or some, of some sort. Until date, he just has never been found. So, so when I hear, you know, when I heard about the Latinji story, it was very, very close to what happened to Daddy at time. I'm hoping that it's not, it doesn't end up the same way, that he's rescued um, and he's uh, brought back home. If, it is, if he, is, he has been arrested, then, you know, he should be charged. If he's, you know, been kidnapped, which is a very weird thing to say, then I hope that, of course, you know, they there's call. negotiations and he's able to uh, come back home to his family. 
There's also sort of some other story that I thought um, caught my attention there, you know, on the, uh, this Nigeria. It is the um, story on Lagos arresting yes, food I wanted to talk about for that. pedestrian bridge users. Very interesting. So, I, I, I mean, the concept of having Agburu collecting fees has become a normal thing, right? They have these associations that collect money from bus drivers they, that will even intercept the bus while the bus is in motion. They can hang on the bus and the driver until the bus driver pays his fees. I want to, I don't know if they are under the National Union of Road Transport Workers, right? They collect fees. You want to park in Lagos. There are people that will collect fees from you for parking. Yep. And now, to use pedestrian bridge is wild to think that a facility that is meant to be accessible to the public is not a privately owned property. I'm shocked to hear. Shocked, but also not surprised in a weird way. Shocked, or maybe disappointed is the word, not shocked. Because in Lagos, anybody can wake up today, a group of persons, and decide they want to start collecting fees for something. Oh, they can true. mount themselves on this road and say, anybody who's crossing, every day you pay 200 naira to. Yeah. So it's just weird to see that. But I'm glad that the Lagos State has started arresting them. It is coming from a, or I believe, that it's, it's coming from a taxation model that was, it was sold, you know, as the way that Lagos worked when President Tudubo was governor. Um, so there was this narish, narrative, rather, that, you know, when he came, you know, he was being frustrated by the Obasanjo government, which eventually turned out to be a lie, or not be a factual. They was being frustrated, and so he had to figure out ways to generate, you know, money in Lagos and this and that, you know, and increase the Lagos State IGR from, you know, this figure to, you know, you know maybe like double or triple, you know, what it was before. Um, but, you know, of course, you know, largely by taxation um, or increasing, you know, taxation, widening the tax bracket, you know, putting more people in tax bracket or maybe just increasing taxes generally um, was, you know, largely how it was done. So, and so here's the thing. When that happened, you know, and that became a, the, the myth with, with regards to how Lagos was run, it then opened the floodgates for everybody to then adopt that whole idea that, oh, we can raise money from taxes. Um, and so, you know, the NER, you just mentioned the NERT, you know, um, way with which, you know, even if, you know, it didn't start in Lagos, these things have, have been there for a bit, you know, it also happens in other parts of the country. But it seems like they, they mirror each other in Lagos. And that's why you, you build five houses and, you know, wake up one morning and put a gate at this end and a gate at this end and call it estate. prime, creamy, jollof estate. estate. Lucky behavior. Where two or three houses are gathered, there are the state abounds. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so you call it creamy spaghetti pasta estate, you know, for the rich and famous. And then and the, the estate will now start collecting start estate, dues. estate dues. They will now put one yes. security at the gate. Very true. And then you have that's password. WhatsApp group. Yes, and then you must have a password. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing gave me more joy in my heart. Now, when Lagos State started demolishing these gates, I say yes. Because it's all fun and games until somebody's life is hanging on a thread because they cannot access a gate because there's no one there to shout for sex and open the gate. <laughs> that, that thing just killed me. <laughs> that, because I think I got traumatized by hearing access, you know, after a while. Um, but yeah, I feel like it is the same model that has now been mirrored in different places. Um, so. You know, a couple of people can just look at one, you know, junction and decide, oh, okay, we can tax people, you know, to cross here. And, you know, start collecting 50 naira, 100 naira. They tax everybody. Tax people who are selling water, tax people who are selling whatever on the road. The people who are even hawking goods on the road, they tax them. I say I went A lot for of this money doesn't make it back to the government. I went, so, I went for someone's baby, um, baby's, her, her son's first chair party. And it was somewhere <laughs> on the mainland. But to be able to navigate the traffic, I, I mean, I, I didn't know my way around there. So her husband was like, oh, there's another road that yep. you can go through that is shorter, but I'll drive ahead of you. I said, okay. So he drove ahead of me to connect me because they were, they were actually, no, it wasn't that we're trying to cut out traffic. They were working on the road that typically leads there. Yep. So this is an alternative route. Do you know that on that alternative route, they were collecting money. Yeah, Some towns were stationed there, collecting money from everybody that passed. And I didn't have yeah. money. I said, I don't know their pain, though. Nobody told me. <laughs> <laughs> I just no, sat down in my car. They abused the hell out of me. Yeah. After abusing me, they told me to get out. But, but, but you know, for, to be fair, you know, I should also mention that this is not 
just a Lagos thing. It happens in many other parts of the country. I remember also a similar story that there's a time that I had to go to Benin by road. And, you know, because Benin, um, our express road, um, road was bad, we had to pass through some of all those villages. And, you know, there were community members in the village that were collecting money, you know, before you pass their road. Um, so it happens everywhere. It's just shocking to hear that for people to pass a pedestrian bridge, you charge them 100 naira. And it wasn't, I think I saw the story yesterday, it wasn't just everybody, it was those people carrying load. So if you're carrying, you know, any, you know, bag, any, you know, look that looks bigger than a regular um, handbag, they charge you 100 naira to and pass then, the And this is the same Lagos where we say that people should not <coughs> cross the express. Because exactly. there's a pedestrian bridge. So it's sort of frustrating the work that the government is doing. And these I people hope who, more people are arrested yeah. and they detain them in a nice and, you know, and the, the, the people who, who are <laughs> collecting these uh, taxes to cross pedestrian bridge they didn't build the bridge. They nope. didn't contribute a dime to They're not even the, the ones bridge. cleaning the bridge. They, have they will no tell business, you, oh, exactly. now we they maintain the yeah, bridge. Exactly. But they're not, they have no business with it. Anyway, yeah, anyway, let's take our final story on the, this Nigerian newspaper. Still on the front page, at the top of the paper. We here begins rehabilitation of 19 FCT schools, grants scholarship to 13,000 students. Wiki is working. Wiki for government. Yeah, but scholarship, um, so it's a story that also needs to be Pro properly to, broken yeah, down. Exactly, you know, because, you know, scholarship, you know, under who? Under, you know, who, yes. who, who is paying, who's for, paying it? for it? Is it from the FCT's account? Or is this personal or is money? It some, yeah, exactly. So it, it might just be interesting to, to um, know exactly what is going on in, in that story. But that, that's where it is. And of course, the NLC and um, Labour Party uh, drama continues. Let's move away from uh, this Nigeria. Remember, you can call our phone lines or the numbers on your screen if you'd like to contribute to the conversation. You like, uh, you have thoughts to share on any of these stories. Um, quickly join us, and we'll love to hear from you. Absolutely. Um, or you could tweet this morning at New Central TV. Let's know your thoughts on these stories. Let's move to the Vanguard newspapers next and see what we can find over there. Um, on the vanguard, Okwama, well, well, killing of soldiers. Okwama women, children trapped in forest for six days. I have spoken about this, you know, and how people who had no business whatsoever with, you know, with, you know, that um, very shocking incident, um, a lot of times, you know, would bear the brunt of, um, of, um, I mean, the retali retali retaliation um, and whatnot. So um, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, like I said, that the governor is able to step in and assure these persons of their safety, let them come back to, you know, live their lives and continue living as, um, as um, good people of Okwama community. Also on the Vanguard, Edo Gubernatorial, 72 hours to go, 10 parties nominate candidates, says INEC. Uh, subsidy removal, 1 billion liters of petrol smuggled out, says the federal government. Okay, not sure who you're telling. Over 15 killed, residents flee as herders attack Bainway communities and we're back to hearing about attacks in the Middle Belt region again. It was, um, uh, it seemed to be, you know, out of the news for a bit. We haven't mm -hmm. heard about any uh, places in the Middle Belt being attacked, but it seems like we're back to it again. Northern senators decry spate of kidnapping violence in the region. Australia announces tough visa rules for Nigerian students and others. State police, only 16 states submitted presentations, says NEC. And also NLC leaders uh, uh, took worker salaries during invasion. Julius Abure is speaking. We spoke about that earlier um, also. Um, and these are the major stories, you know. And um, of course, on top of the uh, screen there, you can see manufacturer's income tax falls 6.85% to $145 billion in quarter three of 2020, or quarter four, I beg your pardon, of 2023. Um, so the two stories that I will quickly just chip in on, you know, are the subsidy removal, one billion liters of petrol smuggled out, says the federal government. You know, when they announce, when they make statements like this. Who is like smuggling this, now? Yeah, exactly. So, so, so why are we being told? And, you know, does that the report also come along with um, announce, uh, uh, I mean, statements to show that certain people have been have arrested? Been caught, exactly. Have been arrested. Those who facilitated the smuggling of petrol, of a billion liters of petrol out of Nigeria. Has anybody been charged? Has anybody been, uh, been arrested? Um, is anybody who, of course, maybe also works um, with the Nigerian government now? I'm not talking about the smugglers now. Are there, you know, internal, you know, members of the Nigerian government? Are there sabot saboteurs that have also been arrested? Are there people that work with, you know, the Nigerian waterways, um, with the customs service, with, you know, uh, Nimasa, whoever else, you know, that maybe has turned, uh, you know, their backs, you know, while these things were going on. Have they been arrested? And also, 
you know, what is being done to ensure that this doesn't continue, that we do not have another couple of years, and then once again here, that billions of liters of petrol have once again been smuggled out. So th that is what I feel should come along with these stories, not just announcing that this is the crime that has been committed. What has been done, and what are we planning to do? Um, the other story there, of course, you know, is the 15 killed and residents flee as the headers attack Benue communities. Another very, very sad story. It's like and every again, other day, there's a new announcement of headers killing or attacking one community in Nigeria. Yeah, you know, and, you know, I, I said, you know, that it seemed like it was calm in the Middle Belt region. Um, so it's heartbreaking to see that we're back, you know, hearing these stories again while we are mourning the soldiers that were killed in the Niger Delta. And of course, you know, still looking for um, those who were kidnapped in Kaduna State and in other parts of Northern Nigeria. It's sad, you know, that now we're... And so, you know, it, it, it sounds like, you know, in different parts of the country, there is one thing or the other. There's some, some crisis or the other that is brewing or that, of course, is taking place. Um, our um, correspondent, our security um, expert, um, Oyekachi Adekol, I believe, yeah. Um, he has always mentioned, you know, that from their analysis, there's always one thing or the other going on. And security analysis across the country doesn't look good. From the Middle Belt to the South-South to northern parts of the country to the Southeast. You know, some parts have been calm lately, but it's just not a good look. And it also, you know, gives more credence to the narrative that the Nigerian security agencies are overstretched. The police can't handle the responsibilities that they should have. Um, they definitely need more hands. They need more, you know, weaponry. They need, you know, more investment in intelligence and science and technology um, and whatnot. Um, do we need the army to also step in here? Maybe not. You know, they, I, I don't think we need to see the army everywhere. But the point is that security agencies are overstretched with having to handle these responsibilities. It's once again, you know, um, a, a, an opportunity to once again call for the creation of proper state policing. Let, you know, every state be able to establish its own security, you know, uh, force. Um, we have, of course, the Ibuboyagos and, and, um, and uh, the ones in the, in the southwest, um, uh, Amotekun, yes. Um, and, of course, civilian JTF in northern Nigeria. But that's not enough. There has to be proper structure. There has to be proper establishment of these security agencies. Um, state police, as they are called, proper funding, proper equipping, you know, of these agencies to re reduce, you know, somehow, some way the occurrence of these um, incidents. I saw that the Minister of Solid Minerals established his mining, uh, uh, what's it called, mining police, or mining, I, I don't remember what the term is, you know, but he established his own small, you know, task force to tackle the stealing of Nigeria's, you know, minerals. And once again, I, I felt in my head that that was, you know, once again, you know, an addition of a new branch of security agency that we do not need um, at this point, but we'll see. Let's take a short break, and when we come back, of course, Breakfast Central continues. Welcome once again. President Bola Tinubu has banned Nigerian ministers, heads of agencies, and other government officials from embarking on publicly funded foreign trips. The announcement was contained in a letter signed by the Chief of Staff to the President, Femi Bajabe Amila, an address to the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, George Akume. The ban would last for three months in the first instance and will take effect on the 1st of April 2024 and is aimed at reducing costs in governance. Tinubu added that government officials who intend to go on, on uh, any public, uh, publicly funded foreign trip must seek and get presidential approval at least two weeks before embarking on such a trip. Joining us this morning is political analyst and DG Heritage Center Abuja, Mr. Kach Ononuju. Good morning and thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Great to have you on the program. Um, I mean, this might sound a bit authoritarian, you know, it doesn't sound like what you would hear, you know, in a democracy, you know, it, it might maybe something you sound you hear in North Korea. Um, is that an extreme way of describing it? Or do you think that, yes, this is very necessary at a time like this? And, you know, kudos to President Tinubu. Well, I think uh, what uh, you're seeing is uh, Tinubu listening to feedback about how Nigerians are saying that him and his people in his government don't seem to understand that the country is economically in dire straits. And him, in trying to react, is now giving these things which you describe as extreme measures. I don't think so. 
It's been very rowdy. Him and those with him have been behaving as if they do not understand that due to the economic crisis in the country, Nigerians are going through a lot. You cannot ask Nigerians to tighten their belts and you are, are taking people who have no reason to travel abroad, collect SAP code, and they're doing this. You're simply showing insensitivity to the truth about the condition in the country. If truly you want us to believe from what you said that the country has been bankrupted economically, then act in a way to show that you have inherited a bankrupted economy and you have to do things to repair it. No, they weren't doing that. Could you imagine a Nigerian agency trying to hold a symposium in a foreign country, Western Esther code? So that is also part, part of the drivers of corruption. When, because of the need to end foreign exchange for themselves privately, Nigerian officials start abandoning their posts and start traveling abroad for the things that can be done here. A lot of the things for good people travel for are things that we can do just like me and you are dealing right now. I'm talking to you via Zoom. Who said they cannot do the meeting via Zoom? And you can talk, people can talk back, there are no pensions, and then you can save the country the money and then charge the money you use in buying data to the government account. Why do you also need to charge the money, the millions that are spent on not only business class tickets, but also you, some of them even buy first class tickets and also pay to themselves estacos from traveling and walking out of station. This is wrong. So I think in the first instance, we are watching Tinubu because you know one thing is the words and rhetoric from politicians is a very different thing from what the actions are. So let us see what the actions will be. Just like I said yesterday on a different program, it's not enough for him to say he wants to solve the problem of insecurity. It's enough for him to also be seen to be doing something about those who have been damaged through the insecurity by restoring Nigerians currently living in IDP camps back into their ancestral villages, homes, and lands. Okay. Uh, I mean, you, you did mention that uh, this is evidence that the government is listening and strongly you've criticized a number of the um, activities that they've taken outside Nigeria. Is there maybe a consideration as to the president himself and his own trip? Because I doubt that I have seen anywhere where it's been mentioned that he himself will reduce his own personal trips. Well, he knows very well that this particular uh, reaction that he is doing now takes from the public condemnation of him putting his children in front of government business. You travel abroad, you take ministers of the republic with you, and then your sons are in front of the ministers of the republic. What job are they doing? What kind of thing is that? When Trump was traveling with Jared Kushner, Jared, despite being the son-in-law to Trump, actually had appointments in the Trump administration. So they could travel as part of government. But in this case, Sinbu's son hold no positions in government. So why should they be before and in front of government business? It is wrong. Let us say that he also will caution himself as he's now cautioning members of his, of his administration. Let's believe he understands that in the same way he is cautioning members of the public and those in his government, he will also caution himself and caution his children. Yeah, I mean, so if, if we still see these signs, because, I mean, the president a few months ago went on a private visit to France, you know, which you, you, you wouldn't randomly hear of that, you know, except here in Nigeria. So, I mean, if we still do not see that, you know, there's caution being put into um, the president himself, and, you know, not having his son be on uh, government trips along with him, the son who's not an elected official, like you've mentioned, you know, do we then interpret it as, you know, really just playing to the gallery? And then also, 
What other steps do you think must be taken um, by the current administration if we truly, truly want to reduce the cost of governance? There is a lot of mistakes Tinubu has done before. You know, buying pleasure cars, take borrowing money to be spent on completing living abode for himself in Lagos, for the vice president in Abuja. Those things are not necessary. He, the man could live in the place where vice president Osiban just stayed in. Him, Tinibu, can stay where Buhari has said him. He has his home, which he lives in Lagos. So why will he be taking money to be renovating a place he stays in Lagos when actually the city of government is in Abuja? So there's a lot of waste during the first six months of Tinibu's administration. Now that he is listening to public commentaries and public criticisms, let us just see that as an improvement from the previous behavior of Buhari, who didn't care about what anybody said, you know, and that's where we are talking about. Let the government be available to listen to what the people say. You saw Buhari, he couldn't even, you know, do performance audit of his ministers. And that's why we're now saying, Tinibu, also make sure you do performance audit of the people you appoint to do work on behalf of Nigerians. So let us just continue to raise our voices and believe that the feedback that gets to him will guide him into doing things for the good of the country. As far as I'm concerned, what we are seeing right now seems to be something much better from the horrendous, atrocious administration of President Buhari. Let's continue to raise our voices. Let's continue to condemn those things that we should condemn and praise the ones that we should praise, like him publishing the names of Buhari's friends and people that were given to Nigeria as terrorist sponsors, which Buhari refused in any way to even react to. Let us also believe that even though he had publicious names of those people who are terrorist sponsors, he should also move in to actually bring them to book. Because it is when you do not punish people for their misbehaviors that they can then go down the lane of impunity. Let it be that those who sponsor terrorism are arrested and prosecuted so that you do not go more to continue to stage all this industrial scale kidnapping of school children, which is a strategy to force the government to come and negotiate. And you know very well, yes, Tinibu said, give me land and I will solve the problem in three weeks. You know very well nobody give him land. So those are part of the issue. Instead of making promises to people he will get them land, tell them the truth, there is no land. Treat the people as they should be. These are refugees running away from the war in Mali, Central African Republic, Cote d'Ivoire, and other places. Create a refugee camp for them. Put water in the refugee camp and put them in a refugee camp. Because if you leave them to be staying in places like the Kamuku Games Rivers in Brinimwari, they will continue to come out to kidnap children in, in Kaduna, Take them back to the bush in Brindingwari for you to negotiate with them as their negotiator and uh, brother in chief, Shegumi, is always available to say, Come and negotiate. Now that he has published the name of Gumi's ally as part of the terrorist uh, sponsors, arrest them also and then do the right thing so as to dissuade others from continuing this idea of playing the same game that they played on President Goodluck when they did the keyboard girl kidnappings, now that they are doing it all over Kaduna State. Bite. Don't just open your teeth. Yeah, maybe, bite. I mean, if you don't Mr. bite, Sanonu, you will not think that you are dangerous. So I, I get that these are the expectations that we should have. And I think everybody has the same expectations. Everyone is making pretty much the same demands. Bite. You know, stop barking, take action here and there. But, I mean, we've looked at the last eight months, you know, of this administration. We've seen what they've you know, the body language that they've had and the moves that they've made. The minister who was suspended till date, there's been no word with regards, you know, whether she would, you know, ask, you know answer more questions um, or whether she will be fully, you know, um, um, uh, replaced as minister. National Assembly was embarrassing itself a few weeks ago with uh, three trillion Naira uh, budget pardon allegations. Senator Ningi was, was, uh, 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 was uh, suspended. 
We've seen, you know, the convoy of, of the of the Senate president and all the, you know, persons in government. So it, it, it doesn't feel sincere, regardless of, you know, how much, you know, it might look like, okay, this is the right step to, to, to take. But look at every other thing that is happening in government, and you can, you can almost tell that there's no sincerity with, you know, if this is really because they're trying to cut down cost of governance, it can't be that, you know, and there's, there doesn't seem to be any difference in the way that things are being done. We have 400 people currently being held by kidnappers, more than 400 even. We, there's no national emergency. There's no, there's no, it doesn't look like the government is even panicking that 400 of its citizens are being held by kidnappers. Over 500 in but, March. I mean, so, so it, it, it's, I mean, it, it just feels like the house is burning. But, you know, oh, look at this cute rabbit here. Ooh, there's, there's nothing. Except I'm, I'm overreacting, you know. Maybe I'm expecting too much. But I just don't no, see no, it. No, 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 you're not overreacting. You are not overreacting. You are correct. There has been no national outrage just because Tinibu has not been leading. And that's why I tell you, Tinibu has to man up, as they say, and then you own the will, the political will to govern. He's not yet governing. He's only reacting. I agree with you. You're very correct. There is no outrage. But they also understand that it is from Tinibu that is expected that in terms of those kidnappings, don't forget the kidnappings didn't happen in a vacuum. The kidnappings happened because the Fulani leaders asked Tinibu to negotiate with their terrorists. Tinibu and the governors refused to negotiate with the terrorists because a lot of these terrorists are not Nigerians. They don't speak Hausa, they don't speak English. They speak Bambara and French. And most of them came from Mali. What they're asking for is land. The land Tinibu said governors should give him, that is not the right way. The truth is, he should have looked at what the truth is. If it was easy for Tinibu to get land, Buhari will have gotten land in eight years with all those tricks with uh, grazing reserve, cows colony, Ruga, national uh, uh, consolidation of underground and surface worker plus six kilometers of embarking land. When even General Danjuma complained that they are looking for wherever there is grass and then there is water so that they can take it to resettle the Fulani refugees. Tinibu should understand that if true, true Nigerians want to take him seriously, he should look at what Nigerian government did in 1974. This is not the first time we're having this refugee crisis from other countries. When Israel invaded East Lebanon, the refugees came from Lebanon to Nigeria. We quartered them in Benin. We quartered some of them in Apapa. We quartered some of the Lebanese in Kano and other places. Now that we have had these Lebanese and uh, these uh, Fulani refugees pour into Nigeria, and now you're having more Fulani militia men run into Nigeria, because of the heat felt by the military cooperation between Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. The right thing for us to do is, if he's sincere about it, let him call it a refugee crisis. Let him then see if we can find a place to put these refugees, not to try to spread them across Nigeria. Nobody will give Tinibu land. It's never going to happen. No community will ever give land for these people who, if they stay with you, the next thing, They'll be looking at how to kill you and take over your territory. It has happened, happened that way before. If Tinibu is to be taken seriously, Tinibu must be seen to be talking the right thing, not making promises to Fulani leaders that he cannot keep. Yeah. All right. I, I also want to ask, you know, if you can paint a picture for us. I can you know, tell you for free. Yeah. Tinibu, nobody will give land for you. Are you there? Yes, yeah, we you are. Know, we're struggling a little bit with the connection. You know, you I, I, you I also now? wanted you to speak a little bit on. Um, you know, can, can you share a picture for us? You know, what the what Nigeria loses to. Okay, fine. I am back to you. I can hear you. Oh, okay. You, I, I wanted you to paint a picture for us. You know, as to what Nigeria loses to these frivolous, uh, frivolous. I beg your pardon. Foreign trips by these ministers. The, you know, Accountant General of the Federation, I think their office was in London.
to, to do you know, a, a, um, a summit a couple of weeks ago, to have a meeting, I can't remember what it was, in, in the UK. And so when we, do you have an idea what we lose to these very, very frivolous uh, trips by Nigeria's ministers and you know, heads of uh, agencies? We lose money. The same money we lose to corruption because those things are actions of corruption. The Akan General has no reason to go to London to do a seminar. Seminar for who? For who? A Canton General Office that should be repairing its books in regards to the former A Canton General's stealing in that office. What you need to do is to fix your office, not to go and start holding seminars in London. Seminars for what? If there are foreign participants in the seminar, you could connect those people through Zoom. And when you're holding the seminar in Nigeria, they can link and participate via Zoom. That is possible. So what who says that they don't have gadgets that can actually allow those people to participate via video? And then you're going there. Why are they going to London in the first place? They are going there because they want to spend foreign exchange. The Canton General's office is a place where corruption is endemic. And the only reason for doing that is to earn extra code, is to spend dollars. And those dollars, what you will ask yourself is, who is the approving authority for these expenditures to be done? You see, there has to be an approving authority before Nigerian officials can go and hold their jamborees abroad. That reason, because they internally do these approvals, is the reasons why they organize it. And they run away and go spend national money. And I can tell you, it is corruption. Nigeria loses a lot of money. And more people do that. What you're talking about, what we're discussing, is the particular one that we saw. What about the ones we don't saw, we don't see, because they are not publicized? So those ones that we don't see are where the problems are, and they occur in multitude of places. And that's why Tinibu needs to now have a grip of this government. I don't think he has a grip on this government. That's why I'm saying there's a lot of corruption still in the government. Tinibu doesn't seem to know that he is still in power. No. He probably was want to enjoy the loot and the paraphernalia of the office without actually sitting down to do the work that the office demands. And right. that's why we have to tell him, you don't need to be doing all this travel. All of Tinibu's travel, what has he brought? The real work to be done is at home. What are you traveling for? All those jamborees, what is it for? You want to go and reassure some people because the previous people who work with them are telling them that uh, you are not uh, respected. You're not doing that. What does Nigeria gain from Qatar? Apart from Qatar, made a lot of input in installing Buhari through their dealings with the Americans. And then, as Buhari has left, people have now gone to tell Qatar that the Tinibu is walking away from uh, the old uh, agreements uh, Buhari was keeping. What do we gain from Qatar? Apart from going there to reassure them that no, you're doing this, nothing has fallen. That's why you see all those Middle East countries have been giving Tinibu trouble. All right. Because a lot mm -hmm. of our brothers have been going there to badmouth Tinibu, and that's why he thinks he needs to go there and repair relations. He doesn't need them. He doesn't need them. All right. Uh, Mr. Anonuju, thank you very much for sharing these thoughts with us. And uh, as always, it's always good to have you. We look forward to having you join us again. Thank you for having me. Thanks thank for joining you. us. Welcome once again. Now, this morning, allow me to pose a question that has been lingering in my mind, but maybe not so much in the mind of many Nigerians, because we've gotten used to regular four years of nothingness. Now, the question is, do our ministers have any key performance indicators, KPIs, as they're called in the corporate world? Are they truly holding those positions with, you know, like concrete plans to improve the sectors that they oversee? Are they merely occupying the seats of power as, you know, rewards for loyalty. I mean, when President um, Tinubu appoints these persons into ministerial positions, do they say to themselves, and then, of course, to the people, that they truly have things that they must accomplish in the time that they are in office? Does Mr. President also have, like, his own key performance indicators with which he judges these people with reasonable timelines as well? Does the Minister for Power have any plans to leave office knowing that he moved the nation from 3,000 megawatts to maybe 12,000 megawatts, maybe 15, 20, if we're lucky? 
or is he there just to hold the seat so there's no vacuum in the in the minister of, uh, ministry of power does mr president set kpis for his health minister humanitarian affairs housing transportation economy trade and investment minister for youth or even tourism let's even use the previous administration for example and, and you know just reflect back what will former president buari say his education minister damo adamo achieved in the time that he was there what metrics did he use in rating his time as minister and what will he say even Godfrey like Fabio achieved as Niger Delta minister from 2019 to 2023. I mean, what did they do? I believe that it should be common sense, you know, to say that, okay, this is where we met things in 2023, for example, and then in two years, 2025 or in 2027, this is what we achieved. But we don't see that. We see ministers appointed to crucial roles taxed with overseeing sectors which are vital to the well-being and progress of our society, and yet all too often we witness a glaring lack of transparency and measurable outcomes. Absolutely nothing. They just exist. So again, where are the clear benchmarks against which their performance can be assessed? It's even normal that we have ministers that nobody even remembers they exist for years except there's some major crisis that puts uh, their name in the news for a couple of hours, and then they once again fade into oblivion. They are ministers that we only hear about when the EFCC accuses them of mismanaging billions of naira. So once again, right from the top, what are the KPIs with which we rate the work of even Mr. President and his 45 ministers? What will any of them be able to beat their chest and say they accomplish in the next four years? And if lack of financing for those programs is the issue, then can Nigerians know early enough so that we know who to call out? You know, let us know that there's no money. You tried, oh, but there was no money, oh, government didn't release money, oh. I mean, let's know that that's the problem. Instead of holding the position for four years, achieving nothing, but of course just photographs and press statements and going to different countries fully funded by the government to attend conferences that are of zero benefit to the Nigerian people. Because really, what else will majority of, again, President Buhari's ministers say they achieved, including Sol Solomon Dalong? A ministerial position isn't just a fill-up space. You're not there simply because, well, there has to be someone. So to Nigerians this morning, we, we spend a lot of time questioning the president. Many have, of, of course, advised that we also ask our governors these same questions. And today I'm asking that we include the ministers. Let's ask them, what have you achieved? What are you doing there as Minister for Tourism for four years and there's still no change in our tourism story, for example? No improvement in, in electricity situation, but we have a minister. Nobody's asked you to maintain status quo at the ministry. That's not why you are there. So please, ask Dele Alake in Solid Minerals, Adidai Adelabu in Power, Lola De John in, in, in Tourism, Doris Anita who is in Trade and Investment, Uche Naji in Science and Technology. What are your KPIs and when? Do we start to call you a success or a failure? Good morning, Nigerians. And that's our package for today here on Breakfast Central. Thank you for joining us. And we hope that our ministers are listening to you know, this call and that they will come <laughs> with the KPIs to let us know exactly what they're doing, what they're planning to do. You know, some of them have been, in fact, there was a time that I, <laughs> for one of the Which Way Nigeria episodes, I actually thought of doing a roll call, and I probably will still do it. Yeah, I, will, I will call all the names and say, okay, the last time we heard from this person was when they said this or when they did this. Yeah. And it will be so amazing to see what that roll call will reveal. Because, again, like we say, what is really the key performance index that we're using to measure their performances? Is it just, you know, some of them, we've not heard from them since December. It's like they just went on. You don't even hear from them. A lot of people you don't hear. Yeah, a lot of them you don't hear. So you don't even know that those ministries exist. Because you don't hear about them. I wonder who is hearing about on a report again. It's like the momentum has yeah, come. That's gone. It has come. I mean, <laughs> it, it, yeah, I think I remember someone was trolling and said there are certain senators you don't hear from except there's crisis. Yeah. Like there are certain senators you don't, you don't even know that they're in the National Assembly because they're just there quietly for four years. Same thing with the ministers. You know, you, they, they're just there. Marking attendance. And yeah, and that's why I said you're not there to maintain status quo. You're not there because, well, there has to be a minister, so let's just put somebody there. There has to be to something that you say, okay, I mean, this is what I've achieved. This is where we met it. This is where we're trying to be. We didn't get there, but at least we got 70%. Very true. 
We will keep asking them these questions and we'll keep calling them and holding them to account. That's what we have committed to doing here on Breakfast Central. It's time for us to say goodbye. Thank you very much for being with us all through the week. It's been a very eventful week. Uh, thanks to our callers and those, of course, who reach out to us on social media. We'll see you again next week. I am Osao Gie Ogbonwa. And I am Olive Emodi. And remember, I always say this on Fridays. Do not drink and drive. Make sure you turn up with sense. Au revoir.